Well, hello for the fourth time, maybe the final time. Uh, I'm uh, Nick Mann, and uh, I'm talking about my book, Forgetful, in a series of uh, episodes on my YouTube channel. And uh, this is the fourth episode, and I'm, uh, I chose to do this one here on the camp campus of Howard University. That building right there is the Frederick Douglass Memorial Hall. And uh, in this uh, book, uh, there are um, out of the out of the 67 chapters in the in the book, uh, six of the chapters happen in that hall. So uh, it's very central to the uh, the story. Uh, if you've seen any of the other episodes, episode one, two, or three, you know that the central character in the book is uh, Dr. Benjamin Parks, who is a professor here at Howard University and teaches a summer seminar on uh, uh, cultural communication. And so in this episode, I'm going to read uh, some segments from that seminar and give you a sense of what that's what that's like. Um, I want to first just briefly review, some of you may have seen previous episodes, some of you maybe not, uh, but in part one uh, I introduced the theme of the book, which is forgetful, and uh, set it against the backdrop of Dr. Benjamin Parks' mom, whose name is Jillian Parks, uh, who traverses the the uh, spectrum of, uh, from dementia to Alzheimer's uh, during the course of the book. In part two, uh, I introduced the Parks family to you, uh, including Ben uh, and his wife, Addie, his two sons, Tony and Rico, and what the, what the interplay is like in uh, sort of a typical Washington, D.C., Family living in Detroit Park, which is the uh, uh, which is the uh, neighborhood just south of uh, Howard University, where I am here. Uh, in part three, I uh, uh, gave a sense of uh, been from his early time uh, and uh, an encounter with chickens. Uh, on a summer visit to his grandparents in, in Selma, Alabama, and uh, how that met, might have been the first episode of forgetfulness uh, for him. Uh, and then I, I brought us back up to the uh, 1960 or 59 through early 2000s time period in which uh, the Michigan Park Gang uh, uh, was introduced, and not the entire gang, but uh, one of Ben's close friends, a woman named DeVito, who was his first uh, love, uh, so to speak, and I give you a sense of that relationship. Uh, so uh, now what I want to uh, do before I get into part four and the pieces I want to read for you in part four. In each of the previous episodes, I've read a, 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 some, a review from someone who's read the book. Uh, this one is very short. It comes from somebody named Jade who posted on Amazon.com. Uh, and she writes, Dr. Ben Parks' seminar on cross-cultural relationships stretched me beyond my own current understanding. I liked that. So that's, uh, that's nice to read, and uh, I appreciated uh, uh, getting that feedback from, uh, from Jade on Amazon.com. So now um, I, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that there's, a, there's another book that was a, a great inspiration for me uh, in writing 
the episodes that happened here in Douglas Hall. Uh, this book here is called The Paper Chase, and it's, it, it was written by J uh, John J. Osborne, Jr., uh, many years ago. Uh, and it's, uh, you may have seen uh, the story, the, fir the first printing was in 1971. You may have seen some of the episodes of the, of the movie, either the movie or the TV series that was based on uh, Osborne's book, uh, in which he, uh, he staged classroom functioning. And in his case, it was in a law school. But it always struck me that that was a, a wonderful thing to do. And uh, then when I started writing this book, I realized that uh, there was an opportunity for Dr. Parks to teach a seminar in the book. And uh, so I, I'm thankful to John J. Osborne for the inspiration of that. Uh, so now I'm just going to get into it and uh, read, uh, starting with the character, uh, Dean Ralph Prescott, who is a dean here at Howard University and who encountered Ben Parks and his business partner, Ted Freer, uh, out in Colorado doing a, 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 a talk on diversity and specifically on the issue of integrating attraction orientation into the conversation about diversity. Uh, and uh, Dean Prescott was uh, was uh, impressed and had this idea, and he pitched the idea to Ben, who uh, turned him down initially. And I want to just pick it up as, as Prescott continues to press the case for Ben teaching this seminar uh, at Howard University. <clears throat> but back from the conference, Prescott contacted Ben and continued to press the case. I'm sorry, Dr. Prescott, but I'm just not feeling it, said Ben on the telephone one evening. Ever seen The Matrix? asked Prescott. Ben had no idea where this new line of attack was coming from, but he marveled at Prescott's craftiness. Yes, I have, he responded wearily. You know, it took Neo a long time to come to accept that he was the one. You remember that? So, Dr. Prescott, why am I the one, challenged Ben. I thought you'd never ask, Dr. Parks. You're the one for three reasons. First, you're smart. Well, Dr. Prescott, you're starting off on very shaky ground. I'm not particularly smart. My dad is smart. One of the characteristics I inherited from my dad is that I work pretty hard. People who work hard through their persistence can come off as appearing to be intelligent to others. Dr. Parks, that's remarkable. Let's say that I'm buying your argument, which, by the way, I don't. Uh, this first reason is really the least important. There are a lot of smart people walking around on the face of the earth who are just plain stupid. Ben couldn't hold it. He burst out laughing, and the laughter continued for an embarrassingly long while. Finally, he stopped, and Prescott asked, You all right? Are you ready for number two? Go ahead, sir, choked Ben. The second reason is you hold a set of values that are frankly very similar to mine, and they are the kind of values that I believe are needed if we ever are to get a better cross-cultural understanding. Remember Dr. King's idea about how if there's ever going to be peace in the world, we have to get away from focusing so much on our tribes and become more ecumenical. That's what I believe, and I think you do too. And before you attempt to parry this one, remember that I saw you in Denver and that your values were very much on display in that setting. Then remained silent. So here's the clincher for me, Dr. Parks. This one wouldn't be very potent if you didn't have the first two qualities, but the first two wouldn't be enough by themselves to make you the one. Suddenly, Ralph Prescott reminded Ben Parks of himself. Ben had done a fair amount of studying in the areas of rhetoric and persuasion. He could be pretty good at it in certain situations, 
and needed these situations when dealing with certain kinds of clients. This was like listening to an even more skilled version of himself. Uh, ben was completely hooked to hear the third and final reason. Vulnerability, Dr. Parks. You've got vulnerability. If I had that quality, I'd do this seminar myself. Prescott paused for effect. I'm too arrogant. I know I'm smart. When I go into a room, as far as I'm concerned, I'm the smartest guy in the room. That just won't do for this seminar. As soon as I showed up and pre presented that vibe for the rest of the summer seminar, folks would be looking for the kinks in my veneer. With you, there's no need to do that. You're vulnerable and don't seem to mind it. You're going to imagine this seminar in ways that I couldn't because you're willing to uh, take risks that I would never take. You're very rare. You're the one. That night's call concluded, although the uh, profuse praise heaped by Ralph Prescott caused Ben enormous anxiety and even larger doses of fear and humble pie, eventually Dr. Prescott's persistence in the intriguing idea of the seminar wore Ben down. So tonight, until he tired, Ben would prep for tomorrow's Saturday seminar. So uh, that's how this uh, came to be. And let me give you a sense of the structure of the seminar. It's a summer seminar. Uh, it's conducted uh, with a group of students, about 30-some 30, 30 students from uh, universities all over the Washington, D.C. area. Georgetown is represented. GW is represented. University of Maryland. Uh, UDC, Howard University, Catholic University, and so forth. Uh, and uh, these students have competed uh, to get into the uh, get into the seminar. So I'm going to go uh, to let's see. Uh, so this is uh, the sat the seminar runs Saturday, Sunday. Uh, June, Saturday, Sunday, July, Saturday, Sunday, August. This is the August Saturday session, so it's the fifth of six sessions of the class. Uh, and uh, uh, let me just read it. Now, what a week. The retreat at the J Street Mansion, the incident in the alley, the night of unexpected and passionate lovemaking with Addie. That Saturday morning, August 1999, Ben wanted to be ready to make this morning's seminar even more special than the previous ones in June and July. As always, he also wanted to see if he'd be able to work through whatever was put on the table. He had no confidence that he could anticipate where these bright and opinionated students would take things, and for a while, as he locked the lightweight centurion into the bike rack between the Ira Aldridge Theater and Frederick Douglass Hall, he thought of Dean Prescott. What a remarkable visionary was Ben's first thought. Also, Ben just couldn't imagine what Prescott had gone through to recruit and assemble these students and to convince their home universities to buy in to the notion of this seminar. He wondered about the dynamics at each of the schools. What he knew back in June, based on the papers they had written as a pre-requirement to compete for a slot in the seminar, was that this group had lived up to Ben's high expectations. Ben thought of the crafty Prescott, how he'd approached Ben in Flagstaff, and then pursued him like a terrier until he'd worn Ben down. Finally, as he walked into Douglas Hall, Ben's thoughts, Ben thought, I don't know if I'll ever do this again, but I'm going to remember and cherish this summer. This has been quite a ride. Good morning, Dr. Parks, Ben heard as he crested the steps up to the second floor. Delia Menendez and Chao Lang stood at the door as if waiting for him to arrive. Good morning, young ladies, he replied. Isn't the classroom open? Ben was distracted by these young ladies and some something he'd observed on more than one occasion during the summer. They were both drop-dead gorgeous. 
been fought to keep the lecherous old man thoughts from showing visibly on his face. This effort, he found, was made much easier because Addie had been so exceedingly nice to him the night before. He realized that Delia was speaking. It's open, she said. I just wanted to say something to you before we went in. Ben slowed his walk forward, stopped in front of them, and waited. Cha spoke hesitantly. Dr. Parks, sir, I have made a comment in my journal. I showed it to Delia and told her that I wanted to discuss with you in private. She said no. She said it should be public so everyone can hear. Cha looked over to Delia for encouragement. Delia nodded, then asked, what would help you, Cha? I'm an undergrad, Dr. Parks. Everyone else is a grad student. They are all very smart and very confident. They have strong opinions. I want to say something, but then I wait my turn. My turn never comes. Another guilty thought. I'm obviously not monitoring and doing a great job of gatekeeping. I should have seen that. Shaw wanted to say something. I should have let her in. Ben was having a hard time staying focused this morning. He, he hoped that he didn't continue because he knew that most, the most important skill required in facilitating a seminar like this was the ability to stay present and in the moment as the process twisted and turned in unexpected directions. Cha continued, Dr. Parks, I want to practice. I want to share with students. But I'm a little shy. Will you help me? Of course I will. How shall I help you, Cha? Call on me, Dr. Parks. Just call on me, okay? How elegantly simple was this request. I will, Cha, and thank you for asking. Okay, so um, let's see, moving right along, now the seminar, the Saturday August seminar has been progressing for some hours, and uh, let's pick it up. Then it hit him, there it was again. He'd managed a whole summer in this seminar without an incident, but couldn't make it through one more weekend without a serious memory lapse. He just had one three days ago with the managers at the city public health agency. Now he had totally forgotten Cha's request. Miss Liang, please forgive me. I believe you wanted to raise something from your journal. The floor is completely yours. The young woman raised her head. Delia poked her once, then she poked her again. Cha visibly collected herself and summoned strength from within. In a quiet voice, she began. Dr. Parks, I thought a lot this month about how you took the mean names that you were called last month. I wrote in my journal that I would have been very hurt. You didn't seem hurt. You didn't even seem angry. I spoke with my family about it and asked my father if he would have been hurt as a Chinese man if he had been called a racial slur and other mean things. He said it would have been his duty as a Chinese man to be angry and to strike back. He said that he couldn't maintain face without responding. I don't understand why you weren't hurt or angry. Ben took his time. He stared around the campus. He stared at the library clock tower that's across the way from where he was teaching. He had stared up at this clock tower many times since he was a little boy. He remembered walking with Richard Roscoe Parks across campus, and his dad would ask, what time is it? Ben would look at the clock tower and proudly answer, Dr. Parks! It was Delia with an agitated voice. I'm here, Delia. I'm here, Cha. I haven't lost my place. I would have answered more quickly if you hadn't added the issue of face. Without that wrinkle, I think I would have quickly said something like, what good would it have done to, for me to get angry? 
But the issue of face is important to your dad, and I respect that, although I probably don't feel the same cultural pressure that he feels. As a black man, maybe I should. And certainly when I was a younger man, I was keener on not being dis disrespected, on not losing face. I'm going to skip a little bit. I wish I had brought a certain book with me, Miss Liang, but I'm going to tell a story and I hope to get it close to right. Is that okay? Shot nodded. It comes from a guy named Bruce Jacobs who wrote a book called Race Manners. Essentially, the author says that he and a friend were out on a certain street somewhere and they encountered a woman. Jacobs, I believe, is black and pre presumably his friend was also black. The woman that they encountered spotted them on the street and did something offensive. I don't remember exactly what it was, but let's say she clutched her purse very tightly in a visible manner that the two black men could see. That's a um, medical chopper that's flying across campus the uh, Children's National Medical Center and the National, uh, uh, Washington National Hospital are right over that way. So that, that was what that chapter was. Jacobs called attention to the Women's Act and said that he was offended and was surprised when his friend said, I don't care. Ben had been looking blankly as he tried to recall the details of the story. Now he looked back directly at Cha and repeated, he really didn't care. And because he didn't care, that paranoid woman, with whatever stereotypes were in her head, didn't have a chance to ruin the friend's day. It's not even that she was trying to ruin his day, but her actions might have had that effect. It doesn't matter. The friend's day was not to be ruined. And this got Jacobs starting to wonder why he cared. And wasn't the friend's attitude somehow more beneficial than his? Josh spoke up. I've seen my father become very angry when he sees how people react to him in public places. He doesn't speak very good English, and he can curse up a storm in Chinese. What's he like an hour later, Cha asked Ben. What's he like two hours later, or even a day later? He's still mad, said Cha. Usually he is. You see, Cha, said Ben, with all due respect to your father, that just doesn't seem like it's worth it to me. I'm not saying that it's easy to not be affected, but what I'm saying is that I don't want other people to be able to hijack how I'm feeling because they say or do something stupid. I've tried to train myself to not care. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. That's the only explanation I can give for how I dealt with the name calling last month. I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, so, um, Let me just read one final review and then I'm going to close up this series. This is from somebody named A.B. in D.C., somebody who came to one of my uh, readings at one of the D.C. public libraries and then read, uh, read the book uh, and uh, sent me this note. Just finished Forgetful. Loved it. Loved the story. Loved Ben, loved the descriptive detail, loved the DC bits, loved the connection with his family, loved having a window into this man's feelings, loved the way it ended. Please write more about these characters. Again, that's from AB in DC. So folks, thank you for watching this segment here on my YouTube channel. 
If you've watched others, thank you for even more for watching more than one. If you've watched all four, uh, I really, really am great, uh, grateful to you. Um, I'd invite you to go on to Twitter and find me at InManDC, at N-M-A-N-N-D-C. Uh, that's where I announce where I'm going to be reading from the book or, or appearing as an, as an author at an event. Uh, and so if you'd like to know uh, that, I'll also probably announce down the road uh, things having to do with my sequel. And A.B. asked me to write more about these characters. I certainly intend to do that. Uh, and finally, uh, I'd love it if you went on to barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com and purchased a copy of the book. And I'd love to get your feedback.